Minecraft, Terraria, No Man's Sky, Temple Run, Spore. What do all these games have in common? Procedurally generated environments. These worlds are never the same twice, and they're functionally infinite. Procedural generation is the umbrella term for many techniques, but the basic theory is the same. Use a single number called a seed to generate a bunch of random numbers, which are then used to generate an environment. The seed is important because we want the same input to generate the same output every time the world is generated. It can't be completely random, because when the player leaves an area and comes back to it, it must be the same. In this video, we're going to work our way through several common techniques and use them to create our very own infinite worlds, although that's barely scratching the surface of what procedural generation is capable of. But first, we're going to explore what not to do. Let's say we're trying to generate a simple but infinite series of connected rooms. It's tempting to start out with one central room, connect some rooms to that, and repeat as the player moves. The world is different every time, and it goes on forever. Works great, right? But then the player quits the game and opens it again. To load the room the player is in, we have to load everything, starting from the very first room. In terms of loading time versus level size, that's not efficient at all. So what's the alternative? Well, let's split the game world into chunks. The contents of each chunk can be generated from three numbers the world seed, and the chunk x and y position. If those numbers stay the same, that is, if the player is in a certain position in a certain world, then the same chunk will be generated no matter how many times the player leaves and comes back. That also means that chunks further away from the player can be deleted to save memory. Much more efficient. And if you're wondering how to make chunks connect to each other, here's a hint. We can also generate a random number using the x and y coordinates of the edges, and use that to figure out where the chunks connect. The right edge of this chunk will generate the same number as the left edge of the chunk to its right. That way, you can generate this chunk without knowing what this chunk looks like. This technique, aptly named chunking, is the basis for the majority of procedurally generated environments. But what about more complex situations? Say we're trying to create islands in specific places, connected by straight bridges. The chunks would look something like this. But to generate a chunk, we first have to know where the islands are in all the surrounding chunks, so we can generate the bridges in the right places. But to generate all those chunks, you first have to generate the ones surrounding them. It seems hopeless, but that's only if we generate the entire chunk at once. Alternatively, we can partially load the surrounding chunks, just the islands, not the bridges, and then load the chunk we actually want to appear. So, as the player moves through the world, the chunks farther away are loaded at a lower level of detail than the closer ones. Even in cases where this isn't strictly necessary, it's a useful technique for detailed worlds. After all, there's no use loading every little detail in a chunk that's far away. Now, for perhaps the most ubiquitous procedural generation technique, noise. For the purposes of this video, noise functions take a coordinate value and return a random value between 0 and 1, represented by shades ranging from black to white. But again, it can't be completely random, that's called white noise and it gets boring pretty fast. Fortunately, there are other algorithms like Perlin noise that give smoother results. And if we generate a bunch of layers of noise at different scales, then combine them, we get what's called fractal noise. This is used for everything from clouds to lava textures, but perhaps most commonly to generate infinite terrain, because fractal noise has this wonderful property where it can be generated at any location independently, and it will still match the surrounding noise values smoothly. Let's start with two-dimensional fractal noise and try filling in the noise values that are less than 0.5. Just by doing that, we've already got a system of caves that extends infinitely in all directions. But if we want something that looks more like normal terrain, we can adjust the noise values artificially, increasing them at the bottom of the chunk and lowering them towards the top. So the bottom is solid ground and the top is air, but everything in between is still interesting terrain. Notice that as we change the scale of the noise, the style of the final result changes drastically. It's always good to experiment. 
But what if you're making a three-dimensional environment? Well, terrain is often defined as a grid of triangles at regular intervals, each one at a different height. So what if we turned this fractal noise into a height map? That means the highest values become peaks on the map, and the lowest values become valleys. This alone looks pretty good, and even forms natural looking coastlines when a simple plane of water is added. But it gets better. Noise doesn't have to be two dimensional. By adding an extra input for a third coordinate, we can get three dimensional noise, which looks like this. Instead of colors, noise values are represented by opacity here. The higher the value, the more transparent. Let's increase the contrast a little so we can see better. This is starting to look familiar. Remember those caves from earlier? Well, here's what they look like in three dimensions, just filling in all the noise values that are less than 0.5. And we can adjust the three-dimensional noise in the same way we did before to get surface terrain that's much more interesting than a simple height map generated from two-dimensional fractal noise. Notice the potential for caves, overhangs, and even hovering bits of land. The only problem with this technique is that, unlike a height map, there's no obvious way to turn it into a bunch of triangles that your graphics card can actually render. There are two widely used techniques that accomplish this. One is to sample the noise at regular intervals on a 3D grid. If that particular spot should be filled in, generate a solid cube. The larger the cubes, the fewer points you will have to check, and the faster your world will generate. This is the trick used by games like Minecraft and Cube World. However, if you want something more smooth and natural looking, you can use the Marching Cubes algorithm. It's pretty technical, so I won't cover it in detail here, but there's a great tutorial in the video description. The basic idea is that it still uses a grid of cubes, but checks the noise values at all eight corners of each cube to generate more accurate geometry. The most important thing to do at this point? Mess around. Offset all your output geometry with more fractal noise for a distorted effect. Try switching between two different algorithms based on 2D Perlin noise to get different biomes. Colors and textures can be procedurally generated. Chunks are important and useful, but nobody says they have to be squares or cubes. How about hexagons? Play around with scale. Here, each chunk of land loads smaller chunks that generate procedural pipes. All that matters is that if you feed your algorithm a specific seed and specific coordinates, it will give you the same result every time. Keep this in mind, check out the resources in the description, mess around to your heart's content, and soon you'll be wandering your very own infinite universe.